Ja. Cool. So I'm, you know, I get performance anxiety pretty badly. So if I stumble here, feel free to jump in. Um, so this, this, does my highlighting show up if I highlight? I guess it does. Yeah. And we can see your mouse cursor as well. Yeah, how good. So this is very key for intuitionists. It's, uh, you know, everything is about from the human point of view. Nothing is God's eye. So there's not very many Platonists among intuitionists. It's kind of where the whole thing starts from. So they're not that interested in whether something is true or not in the abstract. They want to know if you know it's true or not. Which means that, you know, you have to have an exam, you have to show it. You have got a proof or you've got an example or. whatever um I don't, I don't quite understand if anybody else has a better understanding of what he means by computational content i would be interested to know i don't quite when it, when it actually comes down to talking about computational content of proofs it seems to be about normalization and simplification So anyway, I might kind of skip over that, but you know, proofs of content. And this computational content is what is the semantics. Like this is the the operational semantics, if you like, of the logic. It's not truth of truth and falsehood, you know, I still do notations, although I'm not even sure that he doesn't talk about it in that way at all. In that way. Sorry, I'm getting echo. Um so anyway, the invocation of logic and programming is the propositions as types, which it's, you know, Philip Wadler on that is probably easier to understand than Harper. There's also a chapter in that I remember I'm recommending a book ages ago about structural, substructural logics. There's a chapter in that on propositions as types, which is quite helpful. And it actually has some examples and which is, a thing that's often missing in this, and it's certainly missing here, which is I, I suspect why why my going through the exercises is helpful, because you actually get to try and apply it. Do you remember the book name? Uh, it's just introduction to substructural logics. Okay. By Greg Restor. Yeah, it has a chapter called "Formula as Types and." Proofs as terms. Anyway, let's keep going. So we care about two judgments. This is like the distinction between the one, the sense and the reference. So the phi is a, oh, sorry, this is not. Phi is a prop, is a syntactic thing. Phi is true, is a semantic thing. Distinguishes constructive from non constructive logic is that a proposition is not conceived of, of as merely a truth value. That's its denotation, if you like. That's what it refers to, but it, it's actually its meaning is that it's a, a problem statement and a solution to that is a proof. So if you have a proof, you've kind of solved the problem, you know that it's true. Uh, so obviously, this means that constructive logic is not complete in the sense that classical logic is, because that doesn't even make any sense to say that it's complete. So we don't even know what the true propositions are, so we can't claim that, you know, anything that's true we can prove. So it's quite a different way of looking at, at logic. It's incidentally not quite the case that you can't ever um, 
say that the law so the law of excluded middle in general is not a theorem of, of constructive logic but it's not true that you it's also not refutable like the double negation of of um the law of excluded middle is a theorem of constructive logic so it's not the case that it's not the case that phi or not phi which means that in particular cases like here in this example uh, he talks about the natural numbers you can always say whether or not two natural numbers are less than or you know one's less than the other or not so there's a proposition phi that is such that phi or not phi applies in that limited domain so you could prove it with the assumption that you're talking in that space If I'm completely not making sense, just tell me to shut up. You're doing great. I think it's good so far, yeah. So <laughs> I like this, this sentence here. Life is hard, but we muddle through somehow. That's very much an intuition, uh, intuitionist attitude. And it gets a bit mystical in Brower, in Brower as well. Intuitions about numbers and you, you see a little bit of this in um later on uh is it later on or did you just talk about it sorry it was a statement back here the rules of logic oh, what a proof is is a social construct yeah that, again that's a none of this stuff is given like we're, we're not assuming that god is in the picture at all there's no kind of platonic point of view that we can adopt it's all just humans muddling through it's like a philosophical stance that you that intuitionists find particularly um plausible is the wrong word um cogent i guess and i, I have wondered if it's not a personality thing that yeah, some people are classicists by nature and some people are intu intuitionists by nature but anyway, I mean, certainly, correct me if I'm wrong, I guess, Ryan, but I'm guessing most mathematicians are probably Platonists. I think, so. yeah, I, I would say that's probably true. Yeah, I mean, having gone through uni, I don't think there might have been lecturers, who, you know, some of the staff in the maths department might have been able to talk you through intuitionism, but I don't know that any of them would have actually espoused it. Not that we actually sat down and talked about it in detail. Anyway, so constructive logic, is this what we're up to? Um, so this, I'm not quite sure how, why he's introducing it this way. He just sort of says, you know, we talk about it this way. It's true, everybody does, since Genson talk about logic in general not just constructive logic in this way but anyway he doesn't really give a reason he just says this is what we do you know so we've got sequence where you've got hypotheses on the left turnstile something on the right this judgment says the proposition is true assuming that those other things are all true which means they have proofs and then when the on the left is empty then essentially saying this is just a theorem this is just true simpliciter it follows from logic if you like so the structural properties these are the things that are relevant when you're talking about substructural logics this is just the way that your collection of hypotheses behaves so the things on the left uh, reflexive in that you can always add something on the left and on the on the right like you adding yeah I mean this is kind of obviously true this is like an axiom if you assume something is true then it's true you know given that assumption um it's like begging the question it's not in you know it's not in itself a fallacy the fallacy is to suppose you've said anything by just begging the question um so that's just the reflexivity 
principle, so it's transitivity, uh, weakening. So if if uh, from some collection of hypotheses something follows, then it, if you add some random stuff to the hypotheses, it still follows. Um, contraction if you've got two copies of something in the hypotheses you can just you can do the same the same thing carries through if you just get rid of one of them that's the um that's the substructural rule that rust rejects i believe you mean the programming language programming language yeah so in rust Programs in Rust don't obey. You know, it's not a, it's not allowed. You're not allowed to contract. So you end up with a, a kind of a logic. The logic of Rust is the logic without contraction, which, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I I can't confess to being an expert on that. Okay, like but then the whole Prusa's programs thing is. Um, I'm still just getting my head around it. Um, and then the last one is, uh, you know, kind of associativity or ordering. It doesn't matter what order the uh, hypotheses are in. And overall, all this follows just by regarding them as a set. So if you treat the thing on the left as a set, and if you this book on substructural logics that I was talking about, the first thing it does is basically say, yes, that's traditionally looked at as a set. What if we consider it as something with more structure? And so then. You know, you can consider logics that do or don't have some of these substructural or structural properties. Sorry. Anyway, I'm going a bit slow. I should probably speed up a bit. Um, so the syntax is pretty straightforward. I don't think I'm sure everybody's been seeing the notation before. This at least is fairly straightforward. And then the the um Connective rules for the logic. Uh, so this is where it gets interesting with the. Um, when I was first presented with classical logic at uni or in school, wherever it was, it was you know it's like a Hilbert system where you have a bunch of axioms that are just bizarre. Like I mean, they're not bizarre; they they seem sort of seem obviously true, except the longer one. There's this, there was always a third one that was longer, like like Euclid's fifth postulate. There's one that seems harder to follow, but they just seem to be sort of random structures. And then you play around with them, and you say, "Oh, you can do these magic proofs by using modus ponens, the the one rule of detachment, and you get you can prove things." But the how you get there is just a, a bit of a mystery. It always seems a bit of a mystery. Like how do you pick which axiom to use? And so quite early on like Genson in the 30s was introduced this system of natural deduction where it's much more like human reasoning in mathematics where you start from some obvious very obvious principles in fact you almost always start from you know a entails a or a implies b entails a implies b it's just always some proposition entails itself but then you have these more elaborate rules introduction and elimination rules that for the connectives so that you can then from these premises you derive and the, and the structural rules you derive you know all sorts of consequences in your logic involving these connectives so every every connective has its introduction rule and its elimination rule which creates a nice symmetry and according to Girard and co this is like the core aspect of logic that you want an operational semantics to account for which is um like for them this is like the holy grail of logic is explaining this symmetry of introduction and elimination um i was just going to say something about i can't remember what it was uh so the rules are not that hard to follow we should be pretty familiar with them true is just true uh and and introduction just if you've got a proof of each side you've got a proof of the conjunction and elimination is just you know 
if you have a proof of and you can eliminate you can, you can pick either one and continue with that one uh implication is uh, so the uh, implication elimination is just modus ponens it's the classic rule that everybody's familiar with at least i assume you might have called it rule of detachment or it has a couple other names too i think but it's the traditional rule that date dates back to the greek to Greek logics. Uh, implication introduction is, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the deduction theorem. And, you know, if you're doing logic at uni, you probably did the deduction theorem. It's basically a statement that entailment in the meta language is mirrors in some way or is a, is a correlate of implication in the object language so we're modeling the reasoning that we're trying to do if you know what i mean it basically just says it says a kind of equivalence between entails and impl implication it's not equivalent but correlation um falsehood is obviously so, uh sorry so what's yeah. the difference what like there's it's subtle like what's the difference between entailment and implication so entailment is well <laughs> yeah the books on this but yeah we're all getting at this concept of consequence of kind of logical consequence consequence in reasoning what follows from what there's this sort of general concept or possibly cluster of concepts concepts that we're interested in elucidating entailment is like officially it's in our language of mathematics if you like or of metalogic of proof theory it's a thing where we say the stuff on the left has some kind of consequence relation with the thing on the right or the stuff on the right because there's not always not all systems just have one thing on the right sometimes you can have multiple um whereas in entailment like uh, implication is is the connective in a language like it's the language that we're defining the language of logic which has a, the, the and and the or and the not and it has implication and then we're describing the meanings of these operators in this language in terms of well traditionally you know it was in terms of english so you'd say you know uh a and b if and only if a is true and b is true you know when i say a and b i mean a up arrow or, or the you know the what do you call that and symbol if and only if uh a and where i mean you know and the english word b so we we kind of and this is that traditional way of describing logic is what girard and co say that's the sort of denotational version but it's sort of it's slipped the whole operational part or the sense part if you like into English it just says oh we know what these things mean because we speak English you know this is just what we do we, we you know we reason all the time just in ordinary everyday life and we're basically just assuming that for the sense of an expression of a logical expression so we define the logical expression just in terms of the way we say that ordinarily in English but denotation is what it's all about so the truth and the and the falsehood so we create truth tables and we have mappings to models where you know if something is true then it's less than something else in some model or you know the model theory is, is fascinating and interesting but it doesn't tell us about this stuff that's um you know what follows from what or what what does and mean you know kind of deeper sense um and you know what we're doing here is saying well and corresponds in some deeper sense to Com combining like taking pairs or you know holding a couple of things together so it's trying to elucidate it that sense not the denotation the true or false but the sense what does it mean for something to be for a and b to be true or to be you know what does it mean for a and b? what does a and b mean 
whether it's true or not. So I was throwing a lot of words at stuff here. I don't know if that's helpful. So yeah, there's this book, well, actually it's a two volume book by Belknap and Anderson called, I think it's just called Entailment. And they have a whole 60 page appendix on why it makes sense to talk about entailment and implication in the same breath. <laughs> because there are philosophers who've denied that it's, um, that, that that's something that you can do that the deduction theorem is a is a meaningful thing it's that it's not just some sort of you know mathematical trick like quine for example i don't know if you're familiar with um, wb quine he was an american philosopher famously denied that or claimed that if you talked about entailment and ended up at implication you'd change subjects you were talking about a different thing it was a different relation they're not connected and Anderson, Anderson and Belknap's point is no they're related by they're related conceptually semantically if you like they're talking it's it, it, they might not be exactly the same concept but they are talking about the same kind of thing in a different uh, system so from a lay person's point of view they seem to be exactly the same thing and i don't really understand why they're different but well yeah if you, if you think that then you're aligned you're aligned with belknap and anderson okay. and the details are relatively unimportant so the the other argument is just that you know entailment is a relation between propositions implication is just some random truth function in some um denotational language it doesn't even it doesn't even make sense for some people to talk about the sense of a logical expression <clears throat> it's really all just an algebra for uh, deciding what ways you can talk about truth and what ways you can talk about falsehood and the ways that end up all being the same because you know the, all the all the true things are in some sense equivalent and all the false things are in some sense equivalent like this is the classical or a particular view of classical um, logical semantics. Model theory is a pre precisification of that, I guess. Uh, anyway, so, so so if you think that, you know, if you if you find it hard to see the difference, then, you know, uh, that's kind of the point, really. I think Harper would agree that they're kind of similar. In fact, nearly everybody who's doing proof theory will say that they're kind of similar. So, is it? Can I? Is that all right? Can I move on? Or uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, if I'm just blathering, feel free to. No, it's a, it's nice to get a perspective of some someone that studied the subject. So. I find this stuff fascinating. It, it is. I, I can understand why a group, why the the course would skip these chapters because they are a bit different, not kind of directly related to the programming side, except for the conceptual programming pro programs as proofs or proofs as programs. But I, yeah. Anyway, so if also it can't be the case, no introduction. Um, and this is a the, this rule is traditionally called X falso quadly bet. If you can, if you've derived false, you can assume anything. Like if 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 you this essentially invalidates your whole system. Just says it's worthless because if you've got a uh, if you've had the bottom sign on on the, as an assumption somewhere, anything goes. You can just pick an arbitrary assertion and claim it. Traditionally called what? Ex falso quod libet. So from the false in Latin, that's from the false. Whatever you like. So if you if you derive a contradiction, you can just assert anything because your logic is no longer. And actually, there's people who deny this because if you muck around with the structural rules, you can create systems where not everything follows from a contradiction, from a false. Like if, if you're claiming that false is true, you know, you're just not meaning anything anymore. Nothing makes any sense. So you've effectively, it's, a, it's, it's kind of like a reductio ad absurdum of your system. 
but there are systems that you can where you can constrain what follows from if you do get a contradiction you know it's called paraconsistent logics and <laughs> people find them interesting but not very uh, believable but graham priest is a notorious paraconsistent logician he's got any any book by graham well, well not any book but um he's also written books on buddhism but um yeah he's got books on paraconsistent logic where there are true contradictions which is kind of weird um disjunction is a little bit convoluted and you you see this actually in um um something that um oh it wasn't maybe it wasn't this book so all the bending over backwards that happens in the classical logic chapter is partly to show that classical logic just does not behave nicely with this side this sort of semantics another presentation of it that i was reading basically said the disjunctive portion of logic is just just doesn't really work classically from this point of view like truth tables and truth functions and whatnot just fine model theory all good but from this point of view the disjunctive part is complicated where it works better in uh, constructive logic although because you're only considering the positives I think yeah I don't know I don't fully understand the the connections here but um the the thing about the or rules they're a little bit more complicated just well the introduction rules are easy because you know if if you know that phi one is true then phi one or anything else is true obviously by definition of you know if you think about the truth table it makes sense not definition but it's whereas the elimination rule you're basically showing if I can show that phi follows from each disjunct then I can and and I know that the disjunction is true then I know that phi must be true because whichever one is true it follows um it's Does actually, it actually it, need to be both or just one of them and that has to be both it has to follow from both so that you can make the the claim the, you, you can assert phi because you don't care you've got a proof of phi either way you've got a proof of phi from i i see yeah i mean one of them may be false like phi two true may actually be false but the disjunct is true so then phi one would actually have to be true so then the, it's the still second, followed yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 i see um yeah and that's why it's, it's important that we've got these and the, the actual form of the rule in greg Restall's book on the substructural logic book there is a, an explanation of, of some of these um slightly odd that there's a, some properties that you want to maintain in the hypotheses um you want the assumptions to have a, a certain kind of uniformity so that you can um actually jumping ahead he says a bit later in the chapter proof terms in constructive logic are given a dynamics by Genson's principle so Genson's principle essentially says that if you, um so even when you're when you're proving stuff in a natural deduction system it's often easy to get to a point where you have like you can work forwards to get to some sort of formula in the hypotheses and you can work backwards to get to that similar formula on the right hand side and then to join them you can use this rule called cut where which basically just says you know if some collection of hypotheses includes uh, sorry if some collection of hypotheses proves a say and I've got to a point where I have a structure of hypotheses that have a in it then I can just replace that structure with whatever I had to use to get a 
it's a kind of a shorthand and I don't think he talks about it in here. Um, but anyway, this, this cut rule, which is quite, if, if you prove stuff, you use it all the time because it's often, like I say, easy to work backwards from the conclusion and get, well, I can get the conclusion if I know this and then also work forwards from the hypotheses and say, well, I can get to this other thing um, but it has it has you know the formula that I worked backwards to in it somewhere, and I can just do this nice little cut thing, and replace and, and just sort of join paste those two bits of proof together. Like it's just a, humanly speaking, it's just an easy way of doing proofs, easier. And what Genson's principle says basically is that cut is not necessary. Any kind of cut in a system of the sort he. Um, describes a cut is eliminable you can actually do the same proof with um without using cut just using the elimination and introduction rules uh which is nice because it has this property like uh, um harper says that the you don't kind of lose information cut loses information so you can go via you can take a detour um essentially you've 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 found, done a pattern match and you've then thrown away that pattern that you used because uh, it just let you tie those two bits of the proof together. But what he's saying is that, well, that actually, even though you've done that, there is a, there is a proof, there is a, yeah, a proof that doesn't do any shortcuts. And then the proof dynamics that he talks about is all about normalizing proofs so that you end up with the, the kind of normal form proof, the one that shows you all the relevant information. So the structure of this proof is, um, in, in fact, I think the structure, because the structure of the proof is shown in the, in the thing on the left here, the um, proof term, I think all proofs, so all types that are the same will have that same proof structure. Anyway, uh, and now I can't remember why I would jump ahead to Genson. What were we talking about? Uh, oh yeah, why these, um, so why these rules have the kind of form that they do is often to do with uh, finicky details of the Genson proof. So the system has to be the right kind of system. So the rules have to be the right kind of rules. And often, sometimes that means that you end up with these extra formulas, like in this case, you've got phi. Why, why do we have phi when we're in talking about phi one and phi two? Well, it's to do with maintaining a, a consistent set of assumption or a consistent assumption structure. There's this, yeah. yeah and Harper doesn't go into it, so I probably shouldn't have, I probably haven't con uh, clarified anything, but there's a, it talks about it quite a lot in the substructural logics book or in other places as well. Like, you know, the, it's a bit like naming of variables is, is important. If you have two variables with the same name and they clash, that's a problem. Well, this is the same kind of thing, except with assumptions in proofs. You know, you can muck yourself up by mixing your assumptions up and end up allowing uh, invalid conclusions or or whatever. And this is kind of the same, which is really what this chapter is about, actually, is sort of showing that the, the, the kinds of rules that apply to variables in programs are the same kinds of rules that apply to assumptions in proofs. You know, you have to distinguish them. You can't mix them up. You can't have, you, you can't have too many in some sense, although with some structural rules, it doesn't matter if you have too many. But... Anyway, that's the or and then negation in intuitionistic law, certain constructive logic is defined as phi implies bottom. So if you can, so not, not phi means that there is a proof 
of phi implies bottom. So to get to not phi, you have to have a, something a, like a little subproof that starts with phi and ends with bottom. So you have a derived contradiction from from phi. Um, and in, incidentally, if you start with not phi and derive a contradiction, which is quite common in classical logic proofs, as he talks about in that classical chapter, if you start with not phi and derive bottom in, in, in constructive logic, you can only conclude not not phi. So it means that there is no refutation of phi. So you have a proof that there is no refutation of phi. But it does not mean that phi is true because you still don't have a proof of phi. You only have a proof that you can't deny phi, if you know what I mean. And so the law of uh, excluded middle in constructive logic is not not true. Like so, the double negation of phi or not phi is a theorem of constructive logic. But in constructive logic, not not phi does not imply phi. That sort of seems like the key takeaway of the difference between constructive logic and classical, right? Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, I mean, that, that's the key technical takeaway, I guess. The philosophical takeaway is I mean, we're talking constructive logic. So yes, that is the key of constructive logic. Um, but intuitionism is kind of a philosophy as well. It gets a bit more involved. Um, so then the, this proof terms, this is <laughs> the key to propositions as type principles is make explicit the forms of proof. And that's sort of what these do. And I'm assuming, Mike, that um, in, in, in doing some of the exercises, this would have um, become clearer. But you see the structure of a proof building up in the expression on the left. The, the thing before the colon in each case. So, um, yeah, proof term. Sometimes when he says sometimes P is called the proof term, I think everything else I read called the proof term. Um, this is basically a way of labeling propositional expressions, propositions using um, lambda calculus. So you end up with, um, and I can do an example from the uh, substructural book of deriving A implies a implies B implies B, uh, which ends up being um, a lambda expression that is just a simple combinator. But anyway, we can do that if, if it seems useful. So we introduce a whole bunch of idiosyncratic expressions, which are kind of um, lambda calculus with pairs. This case thing, I mean, that's just a funny way of saying nothing doesn't terminate. Yeah, I can can't explain do, that. Later, can't do but, it. Uh, oh, good. Well, well if, you, if you would. Yeah, so like, I mean, right? like if you think of a bottom as void, like a thing that we talked about before, mm -hmm. uh, the type void has no constructors right so when you pattern match over it there's no nothing to pattern match against there's no alternatives right so that's why that yeah. syntax is like that right yeah yeah and it's just it sort of represents something uncomputable if you're in that case you're broken nothing to do can't be done so yeah it's just a, I don't know. I guess the interesting thing though is, right, you can assume that you have a value of void and pattern match against it and then use that in, in your proof, right? But but it can never happen, right? It can never happen, that's exactly, yeah, that's right. So if it can never happen, then, well, 
yeah, it's like the abort statement I vaguely remember from doing compilers. Skip does nothing. Abort is, you know, can't happen. And magic makes any precondition true. <laughs> um, so then we have a bunch of rules that just map these they're kind of the same rules as before but with the um the, the proof terms uh mapped to them so in, instead of so we're treating instead of treating you know talking about phi one true here we're talking about this proof term being of type phi one so it's uh, propositions as types thing and then the, what we're interested in now is these expressions on the left of the column, which go building up a structure that reflects the, the structure of the proof in some way. And, you know, obviously has some sort of computational content because it's the lambda calculus that we're talking about here. Uh, although it seems if we go down like these are, I, I think these are pretty straightforward. Like it's easy to see how these all just, these are all just the same uh, rules as before, except with propositions as types. Um, proof dynamics, which is how proofs develop, is about simplification of proofs. So there's proofs, like I was like saying before, there are proofs that are not in normal form, if you if you know what I mean. Like you can create proofs that are too long, for example, by introducing a, con a conjunction and then eliminating it later, or um, eliminating an or and re, re introducing it later when you know that's just a, an oto step that's absolutely achieves nothing you could have done the exact same thing without that step so you can create proofs that are too long and that this proof dynamics is basically saying this is how you can you know your, your proof can step through to a normal form where you've eliminated any loops and you've eliminated any cuts and you end up with a you know uh, canonical proof and uh, they you know again they the rules make sense I think I don't know if there's any issues with any of the rules if you've got a proof of phi one and a proof of phi two then um, the the conjoined proof like the pair which represents proof of both on the left is just the proof of the first thing. So they're equivalent. So if you end up with something that you have in this expression, P1, P2 pair dot left, then you can reduce that proof to, like you can basically rewrite that proof to just use P1, remove the steps that introduce this other stuff. Um, so reversibility of proof, every proof can be reconstructed from the information that can be extracted from it by elimination. Is that saying? Pretty, oh, right. Yeah, so if you've got a, if you've got a pair, you extract P, the, the left-hand side and you extract the right-hand side and then you join them together, then you've created a loop that you can get rid of. And, and then similarly for the other, what's this, uh, this implication. So modus ponens corresponds to function application and the, what is it? Implication introduction corresponds to function abstraction and likewise if you've abstracted then applied then you have actually done nothing you've ended up back at exactly the same spot so there's loops that could be introduced this way that there's these equivalences that you mean you can reduce your proof um 
Disjunction and falsehood, I don't, yeah, these are harder. Most things that talk about propositions as types, well, not most, I, I haven't read most things that talk about it, but often they will say, they will focus their discussion on conjunction and implication and just sort of say, well, the, the other parts, negation and disjunction, are more complicated you get the idea <laughs> which is you know kudos for going ahead and presenting them but yeah they're harder to follow and then finally propositions as types really good it's just summarizing the I guess he's actually relating it to things that he's talked about in previous chapters, like the product types and some types. And do we have function types? I guess we did. Hmm. Anyway, that, I've talked enough. <laughs> Sorry, it was a very slow walk through the chapter. I think there was something interesting in the notes, but I don't remember. Oh, the notes are great in terms of definitely read some of this stuff. Does he actually mention? No, you got to go to the, if you go to the bibliography, uh, some of these things will be, will be mentioned. Um, sorry, well, some of the references, in particular, Girard proofs and types, which are quite helpful. It's available online. It's a bit older, so there's, there has been developments since that was written, but it's still very, it's a much more um, forgiving introduction. I guess I have saw curry hold isomorphism all the time, and I finally know what that means. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, Howard's paper is um, not too hard to read there's occasionally there's steps where you think why'd you do that i don't really follow but it's only it's only 12 pages um well, i find the reference so i had a question about isomorphism is it the same as a function being a bijection between two things well isomorphism is slightly stronger than a bijection but yeah it it is and it preserves the structure generally. Right. Yeah. Oh. But you have to know what structure you're talking about. So you know when yeah. when uh, <laughs> Girard and um, and co introduced these these correspondences, they explicitly they introduced them and say, well, we haven't made precise what the structure is yet. So technically, this is just a bijection at this stage. And then they go on to introduce the structure and say, well, and now we can talk about it as an isomorphism, although. The structure that they introduce is not is again so the model theory is much more developed than this sort of um proof theory well, it's not really proof theory it's um i don't know what, exactly what you call it. kind of like well i guess it's not really type theory or kind of getting to there but yeah i, mean, yeah, I guess it is it's it's type theory propositions is type so it's you know logic explored from the point of view of uh the sense, as I was saying before, like the operational semantics of a proof, of a, not a proof, a, um, of an expression. So this this here, um, proofs and types, um, but also Howard. Uh, also, that's not, uh, oh, sorry, not that one. No, it is that one. And it's it's not just by Girard, it's by a bunch of people. Anyway, um, Howard, he doesn't have Howard. Okay, well, I can give the Howard reference. So you've got it here. Um, yeah, Howard of the Harry Howard uh, correspondence. His paper is not that hard to follow. It gives you an idea of what he's trying to do. So that's no reference one? Sorry. Which paper? Yeah, I'll just put it in the chat. It's uh, Howard. 
W A Howard. Oh, C O E Howard, not the next Tony. Yeah. Of instruction. Uh, and you can get it somewhere, like if you just go to Google Scholar. Uh, that's right. Howard. Oh, there's a retyped version. Okay. I'll put the, this link. I've actually got a photocopy of the, not a, you know, it's like a PDF. Somebody's made a scan of the original, but this is a re latex version, which is probably a bit easier to read. Um, I don't know if you wanted to go through an exercise or two, Mike. Sure. Let's see. How do I stop that? Okay. Let's stop recording. Okay. This can.